everybody's microphones are on. So we should call this to order. It's, um, we are having a special work session of the Board of Trustees. Um, and it is being live streamed. It is, today is February 20th, 2024. Call to order the meeting at 524. Uh, let's do a quick roll call. Trustee Juliana? Here. Trustee Kesse? Here. Trustee Viando? Here. Trustee Lauz? Uh, Mayor Sheffield here. <laughs> and uh, Andy Freeling is here. He is our village planner uh, and economic development and kinds of things. So um, we're happy you're here. You've been the person who's sort of interacting at, a, at an administrative level with the bid, the committee has been appointed to look into parking um, ideas, options, et cetera. When did they start meeting? Well, they started meeting officially, I guess, when um, I came on board just after November 13th. They started meeting maybe twice a month. Michelle? Um, I didn't know the format that this would be tonight. I apologize, so I kind of came a little official. So I'll just go through my notes if you want. So you wanted us to, you wanted me to put this in an overall picture to yes. give you some scope to. I didn't know that you had that, so yes. To go through the letter and yep. all that. Mm -hmm. All right, So, um, as the mayor indicated, first of all, thank you for inviting me to help the state and explain some of the issues that we've been wrestling with. Uh, so, I'm before the board trustees tonight to discuss the scope of the letter that came to you from the Business Improvement District Acting as a Parking Committee, and the letter was dated February 11th, 2024. Um, as the mayor mentioned, I am the Director of Building and Planning, and I'm here because uh, parking is a planning function. Just like you plan ahead for, for land use, you plan ahead for parking, you plan ahead for environmental services, open space, all these types of things, all sort of planning and parking definitely falls within planning. I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about um, parking in the village. And I'm not going to tell you anything that uh, you don't know. Parking in the village of Port Jefferson is very complicated. It's a, a, a multi-tiered um, approach to parking, and um, it is um, detailed at various different levels. Some may say that parking in the village is a hot mess, but that's not the case. It's not a hot mess. Um, is that the technical term? Yes, that is the technical yeah. term. Uh, so let me let me give you an overall picture of um, parking management in the village, and um, this is just a refresher. You're going to know some of this already, I'm sure. Uh, we have an approximately three square mile village. We have a population of over 8,000 people. Uh, we provide 4,500 free parking passes a year, uh, so that's roughly half our population. There are approximately 1,400 total parking spaces in the village, uh, about 1,048 downtown, which are all metered. Uh, 300 uh, town of Brookhaven Marina parking spaces, which are metered, uh, and 70 parking spaces uptown, which are metered. Uh, last year's parking management uh, parked approximately 200,000 automobiles in our season, so we had a lot of parking going on. Um, about 151,000 of those paid by cell, uh, about 46,000 paid by meter. So the majority of the users of our uh, managed parking system pay for the cell phone. Uh, last year's parking management, oh, so that's right, uh, the revenue generated by the parking management was in the neighborhood of $640,000 for the 2023 se season. Um, the revenue generated in the shoulder seasons was almost as much as generated in the peak seasons. So our shoulder seasons are just as important as our peak seasons. And you know that our shoulder seasons are April, May, September, October, November, and part of December, and our peak season is June, July, and August. We have always been striving towards a more perfect management program for our parking. We have many uh, intelligent and informed citizens and business owners in the village, and many of them have made suggestions over time. Uh, under this new administration, the parking committee was reinvigorated and set to work when I got here in November. So when you came on board, you reinvigorated the committee, they started to go to work, but they really didn't go to work until uh, I came on board and they started meeting. Um, just a little bit more in the history. 
The managed parking program began in uh, 2006 under Mayor Mike Lee. Uh, the program at the time, the program's revenue was taken in by meters only at the time. In 2013, um, the village uh, adopted uh, Mobile Now, which was the app parking system, the application through your phone parking system. In 2017, we uh, retained the parking administrator full time. Um, in that year, uh, some of the meters that uh, were installed uh, in 26, 2006 that weren't operating properly uh, went to solar. Uh, let's see what else I can pull out of this. Um, when the parking uh, started in 2013, the transaction or the pay by sale method is up to 81% and never lower than 75%. So some of the claims with regard to our uh, parking methods, um, the data may not support that. Uh, by 2020, um, parking by cell phone was basically more the mainstream, and um, there's over 80 scanned park opportunities within the village to do um, parking, including a QR code and a text park system. In 2021, we migrated to a pay by plate technology, so that's very new the uh, automated license plate reader, and that's the ALPR. Uh, so that was just a little bit more of the background history. Okay, so here we are. We have this letter uh, from the uh, board of, uh, sorry, from the business improvement district. Um, as I indicated, the uh, parking committee met several times. Uh, what we learned. Let me pass this. Up. So something that helped me out a lot was to try and put into perspective uh, the parking, overall parking system in the village. So I apologize that my uh, graphics capabilities are not what I left in the county, so I was able to scratch this together. Okay. So this is just an overall schematic of the parking system in the village. Right. Uh, when the committee met, uh, you can see the very first box. That's just the incorporation of the, uh, of the committee, and we've got the committee chair. Uh, what the committee did first was they established goals for their operating um, organization. So they set their goals, and you can see that they came up with um, four main goals. I'm not going to read them, just to preserve time. Hopefully you can see all that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Because it is kind of tiny. Uh, so when they took a look at this whole octopus of issues and all the different areas that they were going to have to focus on, the chair of the committee and the committee itself felt that they should take one piece at a time and they decided to focus on the downtown district. The membership of the committee at the time was most familiar with downtown and it made sense to take it by piece by piece. So they focused on the downtown district. You can see the downtown district has lots of issues uh, separated by operational variables and capital. So that's just an overview, just to show you what we, what we went to work with. And we're working right now just on that one piece, just on the downtown district. So the committee structure was intended to represent um, a consensus of the business improvement district, the chamber and the chamber of commerce through the communication network that they've established with their membership. So we relied on them to broadcast out the issues that we were discussing and to get feedback back to the committee and that's the democratic process we formed the committee the committee represented the business improvement district and the chamber and we expected them to absorb uh, comments from them uh, the working premise of the central uh, business district the c1 was um, as established by the committee as you can see in goal number one was the turnover of spaces and the ease of understanding of the system by visitors so that was the premise that the parking committee tackled the downtown district with. They wanted a uh, turnover and they wanted um, visitors to be able to easily understand what's going on in the parking system in the village. So the results of this process in 2011 resulted in the letter that you see as uh, supplied. Do you all have copies of the letter? Oh, I forgot to bring my extra copies. I'm just going to go through the letter. Okay, I'm not going to go through it 
uh, line by line, this piece one, by right? piece. Yes. You need it? Sure. If you have extra, sure. So we met with the committee several times. I met with the chamber and the bid um, at, one of the, at one of their last meetings. Um, the parking administrator, the parking department, and myself met with the chair of the committee on at least two occasions and uh, tried to hammer out some agreement, some understanding. The letter that the um, chair provided uh, wasn't the full understanding that we had together. So we have a, a memo in the works that's going back just to um, discuss some of the points made. But I'll talk, I'll talk about some of those points now. Okay, so the, um, as, as you see, the first cover, the cover of the letter just says that they formed the district, uh, formed the committee, I'm sorry, and um, the bid is the subcommittee, it is the um, parking district committee, a subcommittee of the overall bid and the chamber. Um, so they started with um, policy on the second page. They start with policy. Their first uh, observation is that um, text to park is a new technology. Um, you simply put in uh, PJ to 7549 to pay for parking. Uh, they're asking in item number one to have the signage change to reflect this payment method. It's really not a new payment method. We've always had the ability to text the park. It just was never emphasized the QR code seemed to be the, um, at the time, seemed to be the uh, more better way to do it, but we've always had text the park, and they're recommending that we just rearrange the signage to emphasize text the park. The bid feels, the chair of the bid, representing the bid in the chamber, feels that text the park is a simpler way to do it than an app. Was there um, sort of data that's looked at on, online, you know, with, uh, or, or local so, data about this? So I can say that the data does not generally support the observations that are being relayed to us from the bid. The data just that just really doesn't support that. We can give you the data on any point that you want. Kevin is here to provide you with data if you want it now. But I'm, I'm going to say, generally speaking, the data doesn't um, doesn't support the anecdotal evidence that they are providing to us. That doesn't mean we should ignore it, but the data just doesn't support it always. Um, so that was their first suggestion, is that we should flip over to, to uh, uh, on the signage to uh, pay by text. Their second uh, recommendation was to remove all the outdated signage. So we have a number of um, signs that still say pay by space number. We don't have a disagreement with that. We should really bring up all those signs uh, to, to date. Um, they're recommending uniform signage for the times and days. This is item three. For uh, the times and days are different on the streets mentioned, Main Street, East Main Street, Arden, Broadway. So the signage is different for the timage, and they're recommending that they um, blend the timing so the enforcement periods are uh, more consistent. And that would be one hour parking from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week for Main Street. For Arden, one hour parking, 8 a.m. To, to 8 p.m., seven days. East Main Street would be two hour parking, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days and Broadway and the other streets with time parking, two hour parking, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days. So they- What data did they use to come up with this recommendation? Um, I would say they used their internal data. They felt that, anecdotal data maybe, but they felt that in the, uh, the downtown business, which is pre predominantly restaurants, that a two hour turnover was what they were going for. Turnover tables every two hours. Their peak times was 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. They felt a two-hour time limit would turn tables over. That's, the, that's where they were going. All their discussions were related to uh, what do we want in the downtown? We want turnover and we want ease of parking. So they... So, so you're, you're at, uh, let's say, Tiger Lily. Yes. Is that a two-hour table? Is that, is that what they're... On each, so East Main Street, they're suggesting it's two-hour... And, and according to James, the merchants are happy with that. Two hours? Two hours. Uh, that's the maximum. Obviously, yeah. if you're in Tiger Lilies and you have a sandwich and you're out of there in an hour, that's great. You've turned over the parking space. 
what they're trying to do is prevent people from staying in that space all night long. Yeah. Because they want to turn over the tables. Mm -hmm. after, ten, after 8 o'clock, it's not their peak season and their peak time, and they're not so concerned. Yeah. Is there justification for one hour on Main Street? Uh, it, um, I think it is right now one hour on Main Street. Yeah, so, it is. Uh, I don't know how it was justified then. But the, some of the Main Street restaurants are um, quick returnal, I think. But or sh shops. And some shops. Yeah. So we've done some. And who's enforcing one? Quick, who's enforcing parking at 8 a.m.? Uh, nobody's enforcing it now. Yeah. There's no one there. No one. The, the code gets on at 10 a.m. So is that a, is, is that something that they? feel strongly about to start parking? The, um, I think the parking, correct me if I'm wrong, is 8 to 10. So it's already at 8. So I think what they're doing is they're shading off to two hours in the back end. Is it till, is it till 10? I believe it is. How about Main Street? 8 p.m.? There's no 10? I'm sorry. I, I stand correct. So, so currently it ends at 8? And on Main Street, East Main. Yeah. I'm not sure that's I mean, you would six on East Main. Ten six. Six PM on East Main. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's presently six PM on East Main Street. Mm -hmm. Parts of East Main Street also have like a ten minute parking in front of the, the post office. I'll give you a map. This shows important times. It just it's all disparate, I guess, is their point. That is their point. Yeah. Yes. But I guess I, I'm curious to understand like we're talking about there's restaurants and then there's shops. You know, so a retail shop, uh, I imagine, is wanting to have even more of that turnover than a restaurant because theoretically, oh, I need to pick up a birthday present or I'm gonna go you know, and so it's that uh, quicker visit. Um, but the retail shops typically close by six. Five, six. Five, six. And then people are kind of in and parked for dinner there, thereafter, I would think. Um, so we rely on the expertise of the bid and the chamber to provide discussions with the merchants on East and, and Broadway yes, in East Main Street. Where Main Street is also 30 minutes. Yeah. But I remember parking and wondering can I get a haircut that fast to get out. It was an hour, went back to 30, then back up it's to an hour. Switched a couple it's of times. Yeah. Well, I think the point is that we have changed the times. Yeah. Okay. So they're recommending yeah. just to finish they're just recommending homogenizing the times and I would imagine that's for ease of patrons coming to the I, I agree with that. I'm just curious, um, the the end time, the 8 p.m. If if that's the most sensible time, is it a little bit earlier? I'm imagining the folks you know coming in for for dinner and then not having to uh, worry about their parking necessarily. Essentially, it's it, in the in the evening. If you come in and you get a a free spot on East Main Street, um, you're, there for the night. you're there for the night, and there's but you're not. You know, if you're if you're there for sort of a dinner session, it's not like um, there's necessarily two peak dinner sessions. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that there's a peak dinner session after eight. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think I think the clientele changes after dinner. Yes, it's and post then, post dinner. You're not looking to roll out your customers every two hours. Those customers are there for the night. Kind of. Right. So, but again. I'm not a merchant, I'm not a restaurateur, I relied on the bid in the chamber to have those discussions and relate back to the parking committee, what's the optimum time for your downtown commercial business district for turnover? Mm -hmm. And this is what they came back with. Well, people forget about East Main. Mm -hmm. It should be on Main Street and it's crowded as heck. You walk up towards the libraries and say, where is everybody? Mm -hmm. Different kinds of establishments as yeah. well. Also, keep, keep in mind on East Main, on the east side of East Main, it's mostly residential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't. It was, 
It was my vision tonight to just to go through this, and I would imagine that you would want to speak with the chair of the committee, and you would want to bring us back again, parking, and bring people back, bring the treasurer back. So, anticipating <laughs> anticipating that this could be a longer discussion, um, I was hoping to just get through this so we all understand what's in it, and then if we have specific questions, then we can we can go back. Um, okay, so under four two, they just recommended um, removing the term excluding holidays. So a signage says eight to eight, excluding holidays. I think it might have even said excluding certain holidays or something, but we think it should just probably even just take out holidays. And this way it could be at the village's discretion, whatever they want to charge or not charge. Do we know the reason why we excluded holidays anyway? Well, I guess place, like, why, would, why would you? What's the rationale for excluding a holiday when I can't speak. everybody's downtown shopping and going out to eat on holidays? That's really when they come to the you know that's when one, one more reason why they would come to the village would be on a holiday. Yeah. On a holiday. I, I agree, and and also, I mean, a holiday. To, yeah, there's what is a holiday anywhere? President's right. Day is that a holiday? Uh, you know, the, the first day of Passover. It's, almost like right. it's intended yeah. for, uh, excuse me, for interrupt. it's almost like it's intended for residents, residential parking. We don't charge them. Holiday, we don't charge them. I think it's a leftover from, right from Brooklyn. Probably is. Yeah. Yeah. City or I mean, New York right. City does that. Right, all the inside of the street. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They move yeah. their cars. Yes. I mean, I have three calendars and they all list three different holidays and they don't list the same holidays exactly. on the calendar, yeah. so they yeah. get very yeah. confused. Which holiday is it? Is right. it Kwanzaa? Is right. it Christmas? Right. Or is it yes. recognized Christmas? National Holiday. Yeah. 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 Right. So, I'd like to see right. that one. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> they made a recommendation on the third page, number four, uh, that the handicapped space on Arden should be moved uh, from the space that it is now to the last space down by Trader's Cove parking lot. Um, that is in concert with the next item, number five, where they would like to create some uh, quick pickup and drop off spots along Arden. So we had a conversation about that. Number one, moving the uh, handicap space intuitively didn't really seem to uh, be a problem. It's at that corner, there's a lot of activity at that corner. Um, it was felt that um, it would be safer to move down. But we need to um, now check with ADA because now somebody getting out over there is going to be rolling uphill to get to Main Street, which may or may not be an issue. I don't know. Uh, and then, there was a curb cut. And then there's the curb cut going into the parking lot over there. So. Question, if I can. Um, that handicap space wasn't always there. Do we know when that handicap space was moved into that handicap space? I don't know. It was recent. 1718. Was Kevin there? Mm -hmm. He says he does. Is it. it required? I don't believe it is. Or did he? I'm speculating, but I don't think so. Well, Steve might know the history of that, and we can probably get that from My guess is also it's a little dangerous for a person who might be unloading coming out on the driver's side. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would be curious. Yeah. to understand why a handicapped parking spot was put on the street anyway. Yeah. So as that corner as that corner functions, it's it's whited out there and there's a lot of stopping, delivery, and pick up and drop off, a lot of stuff going on there and have the handicapped space there made a conflict. So maybe that was the impetus for moving it away from that area and then having mm -hmm. uh, 10 minute pick up and drop off spots there. So maybe they, they wouldn't have to park in the white in mean, that next out area. That's radius, turning radius right. and safety area they shouldn't be parking. So there was that discussion. What, what, what started that discussion? I don't know. But that was the discussion. We didn't think, number one, I think we were pretty much neutral on the movement of the handicapped space. We thought it might be a better idea to move it away from all that activity on the corner. So we, we were okay with that. We want to check ADA and all those issues. Uh, the second thing, though, was that we didn't think dedicating all of those parking spaces to quick pickup spaces was a good idea. We went back and forth with, uh, with the chair. And uh, you know, we're thinking two, maybe three quick pickup spaces, leaving two or three long term spaces for the restaurant there. So we had a disagreement, a uh, discussion. difference of opinion and discussion on that. And um, you know, he came out and said that they should all go, but we think that it shouldn't all be those. So when you get my memo, we'll have that discussion. 
what is a, uh, an appropriate agency, or whether local or, or national, to look to for uh, best, that someone might come in and look for best placement of handicapped spaces in this? Well, we'll go to the ADA regs, we'll talk to the building inspector specifically. So best spot might be just inside the parking lot, first spot, the safest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. safest, exactly. If you're not getting out on the street. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have an accessible band where a door has to open and a wheelchair has to come down a ramp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no yeah, there's wheelchair accessible mm -hmm. um, you know, mark out there. And how could there be? Right. It couldn't right. be. Same is true on actually on, on Thompson Street where the library is. There is uh, a um, yes. handicap mm -hmm. parking right. spot right. 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 at yeah. the, the first spot mm -hmm. on the right. For, but that also is kind of confusing to me. It's well, when you do parking for development, you know, certain amount of spaces and they require a certain amount of handicap spaces as a ratio. Well, I don't know how we have came up to how many parking spaces we need. Is it need required for on the street parking? I don't know. I've never, I've I've never seen so I think it's just as a courtesy. As a courtesy. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I'm wondering if there's, again, like a local nonprofit you know, group that might send someone out to help the village assess very specifically the handicap. Uh, you know, because we, we could sit here and guess all day, but right. there, you know, there are entire orgs who... Andy will check with the... We'll look at the law. law. We'll look at the code, we'll look at the law, we'll, we'll talk to some of the folks. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the law and the, yeah. There's mm -hmm. people we'll, we'll who spend the a lot of time interpreting it. So. I think it makes a lot of sense to put that handicapped spot in the parking lot. In the library parking lot and the... Yeah. And the trainer's code. Mm -hmm. Just for safety. There are handicapped parking spots in Trader's Cove on the first, mm -hmm. not on the inside mm -hmm. uh, of the turn, but on the opposite, on the, on the, on the east side of right. that first entryway. And then there's see. others too. Maybe you might even hear from a resident who's ever used it. Yeah. I've just never just ever seen it. anybody really use it. I guess I've seen people park there, not witnessed. Right. Yeah, there's different. There's different degrees of disability, yes. Could be somebody with COPD who can't walk or anything. Okay, so you had, you know, they, they had some other ideas um, of restriping a different color, uh, changing some of the signage over there, um, and the dates and days a week, and again, the signage a different color. We had a discussion with uh, Steve Gallagher, and uh, it doesn't look like we have, it doesn't look like we can uh, accommodate that. Parking signage is pretty much where it will be. And uh, it's not too much in the way of uh, paint for streets that are acceptable either. The bid for maybe, you know, royal purple or something like that, or stormy blue, or so, some color other than the standard blue and white. But apparently, we don't have too many options when it comes to street markings, according to the DOT. Right. The DOT, regular DOT. Yeah. So we'll look at that. Um. I know that uh, a lot of this comes down to enforcement, so back to the mayor's question of uh, that, you know, that also is 8 a.m. start time. Um, it's, uh, you're not enforcing it even for two hours a day, then uh, that makes it even trickier to enforce. Uh, you know, I feel like it's likely we could just have code looking at these quick pickup spaces uh, just to make sure that they're, they're being turned over properly. Um, and he did not think that any of the recommendations affected his operations much. That's good. I, I know, I think it was before Andy came on, we had an interesting conversation as a board about the um, parking spaces in front of the post office and how there were four 10 minute turnover spaces there. Um, and the idea, was, and it was suggested to get rid of two of them because nobody was enforcing the turnover which to me didn't seem like the logical way to, you know, if, if they're needed, they're needed, and they, it should be enforced, and if not, then you can get rid of it, but, um, you know, just uh, both enforcement and also obviously wanting to make sure that people parking there is very, very, very clear, because we don't wanna, you know, we, we're, we're trying to become friendlier in a, in a sense. The, the technology now in the, um, in PJ3, the code car that has the API reader in it, can sense when the car parked, the, marks the car when it was, when it, when it takes a loop around, they know how long the car has been parked there. 
So it's almost like a, a virtual chalk. Sure. Mm -hmm. How often do they loop? As often as they they do. You know that 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 car in particular, and I don't know if or when we're going to get more readers for other cars, um, but <coughs> that car in particular is constantly roaming the, the downtown area. There's really no reason for it to be anywhere. If it's an automated license plate reader car vehicle, it, there's really not much reason for it to be Maybe anywhere. Maybe it's up the Perry Street block. Well, the commercial district. Well, it goes to the beaches, the beaches, I think, too. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity to use that technology and more. And more. Um, so item six was the uh, metered parking schedule recommendations. And again, this is uh, focusing on to manage the turnover of the parking during the peak season. They're recommending using metered parking only during the period of May through September. And um, those hours should be 12 to 8, 12 p.m. to 8, seven days a week. That's the muted parking in the lots. What is the logic there? Uh, business friendly. Um, pretty much uh, to reflect the usage of their customers and their impression of um, getting the turnover and when they need the turnover and when they don't. Do we feel that parking suppresses visitation? Um, I don't think that it suppresses visitation, but I don't think they feel that it's needed during those months because we don't have a high demand, which is, again, the data contradicts that. We bring in almost as much revenue in the shoulder seasons as we do during the peak seasons, com combined shoulder seasons and peak seasons. So right. even, even the weekends here, I mean, any nice... I can tell you Friday, Friday night, my wife and I had reservations at Pasta Pasta at 5 o'clock. Couldn't find a parking spot. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. Yeah. Got to get them to turn over so you can find your two hours of parking. Five o'clock, that's early. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, no, I know. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No, it was, we had to park in the village lot. I mean, there's nothing anywhere near across the cross. Mm -hmm. They're also recommending in six to uh, raise the rate to a dollar fifty per hour with a two with a two hour minimum. Okay. Quick and question. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but Stan's remark made me wonder. We are enforcing on street parking during the off season. We should be. The on street parking is not metered parking, mm -hmm. right. and you're still only allowed to park there two hours. Whatever it whatever is, it states your I'm not aware of any policy that suspends the enforcement of parking on the streets. And, uh, if I look at the if I, I look at the, doc, the data that Rita provides weekly on the weekend parking tickets that are issued, uh, these Main Street, there are, you know, it, she, she indicates location. Does everybody get those? No. Do you, do you want to get those? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rita has that. Rita provides those. And it says uh, infraction, person issuing, the ticket, uh, a couple of layers location, and uh, what um, location, person who issued the ticket, uh, date. So anyway, um, it's it's all it's good data to have. It's informative, um, but uh, I think I think what you're going to find is that the data does not support the want of a better term the allegations of what's wrong with parking. I think there's a lot of anecdotal issues, and some people may have a certain subset of customers that have certain issues, but overall, the parking system works very well. Uh, if there's an industry standard of a 5% failure rate on your meters and everything like that, we're in that window. So we are um, a model parking district, if not kind of on the cutting edge of some of the stuff that we do. All right, so I'm not, I'm not going to um, uh, 
We'll go back to um, pricing, but they're recommending to raise the rates to $1.50 per hour with two hour minimum and then a special all night rate, which we don't have much of uh, an issue with at face value. Quick question. So if you're in a restaurant, let's say, and you're coming up on your two hours, is there a way from your phone to re-up? Yes. Not if you're on Main Street. And no, right. right. You have to move it. Yeah. Right. But if you're in a lot, and is there a limited number of times you can re-up? No, which brings us to you may want to pay one price for all night, which is what the works with. I can tell you when I visit my children in Arlington, they have a, well, they have a pretty good parking system where you use an app, and if you're running out of time, it alerts you and you can re up. But generally, depending upon the location, you can only re up once, maybe twice, and then you have to move the car. Oh, wow. I don't think we have a limitation on that, but it, well, we do have a system that reminds you when your parking's about to expire. Yeah, it does. I've, I've been with friends down there, and you, what, what is it? You get a text message if you've paid? And you have to vacate the spot for at least a certain amount of time before the app lets you use the same spot again. And that, that's in Arlington. Yeah, because I, I think other municipalities. Washington, D.C. There you go. Um, they have, it's, you know, like on our main street or East Main, it's a two hour limit. Um, but it's, yeah, it's free, but it's a two hour limit. Um, but others will say, you know, you have to pay for parking, and I know any cash pod, beach, or other places will have this too, where yeah, you can only pay for so much for the meter, or and then, and then you gotta, you gotta move. Um, I guess with the so that that I that I feel is a little bit more business unfriendly because it's like you're having a nice dinner with someone, and oh, sorry, like, two two hours, yeah, goodbye. Right. Um, yeah, right. So we're, we're looking at the recommendations from the business community. Not everybody else. Right. Not, this is just what the business community thinks is best for them, for the commercial business district. Mm -hmm. We may have other considerations. The board may have other considerations as well. Um, I, I do with the increasing parking um, per hour, uh, the fees. What is it over in, in Brookhaven lot? Five dollars an hour. Yeah. Five dollars an hour. Five dollars. But I think I feel like that. There's room to grow with our neighbor. But with other communities, they're about up fifty. Yeah. So we're a dollar. Right? So okay. find the park. Sometimes we bump it up to one fifty, but everybody else still is. Except for Brookhaven, which is fine. So item seven, they um, wanted to talk about uh, the tennis court parking lot. It's half resident, half uh, metered. They were uh, recommending that it will be converted to meter spaces and asking the village uh, to implement a policy that village employees don't park in this lot. We don't really see a difference. One, you know, residents can park free over there. If we make it all metered, residents can still park free over there. Except that there's a tendency that, um, you know, if you're a visitor, you'll be pushed to one side, and maybe there's a better opportunity if you're a resident to get a spot next to the tennis court. But we don't really think that that's much of an issue there. And now that just on the side, now that the Fox and Rec is moving, there might be an opportunity to expand that. So, um, that's not why we moved. No, no. Just, you know, <laughs> to put more parking yeah. in there. When I put my parking hat on, that becomes a vacant <laughs> area yeah, that could sure. get striped. You want to gravel it, you want to dirt it, whatever it is, that could be overflow parking. But, like if you want residents out here with Johnny Mitchell signs, uh, you have yeah. 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 Uh, there's a, a yeah, there's a tolerance for little, trustees. I mean, I'm also a resident. <laughs> um, but no, it's, there's, a, there's a very slim tolerance for paving, especially hardscaping anymore space, especially in our downtown with all the flooding. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, people can talk about cisterns and this and that all day long, but uh, if you look at it. dating, I don't, you know, it could be, you know, we can meet you halfway. We just park on the, on the ground. Could be, we, could do, we could do grass and pavers, too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We got those yeah. trucks out of there. You know, um, because we don't want trucks in right. there. Yeah. <laughs> so cars only. But just remember that when we have a happening in the village, we have more free parking passes than we do parking spaces. So sure. we're always looking for additional parking areas. Sure. Nobody, nobody, well, let me just say, we don't have the revenue to build a parking structure whether we want it or not at this time. So all we have is the ability to, to expand surface parking or to get people to keep rolling out of those spots so we can keep turning over those spots. That's the manager. Well, right. I, I, you know, as someone sitting here uh, on this board, but also as someone who has 
trying to find parking as a resident, uh, I, I would strongly advocate for not getting rid of the resident spots uh, in this near the tennis courts. Just because those are at peak times, those are always full of residents, and I think you know above all, we're we're here to make sure that our residents can come and enjoy the village they live in. Um, those they're not even like super prime spots. It's not like that's right behind the bit. You know, you still have to walk a little bit. But for uh, for families who are trying to take their kids to the park there, they're you know going to play tennis, or if they're going to go into the village, I don't think getting rid of any resident spots right now is. I personally don't have much politics for that. Please note it. I'm not here to deliberate this. We're no, just here sure, to sure. explain what they put down. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to your point, I think we're going to have to maybe also get some public input on this from. From that point of view, about eliminating resident spots, we can do it. Sure, that's a good idea. Because remember, that spot was a, that lot was originally all resident, and then it was changed to half resident, mm -hmm. half meter. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of this is anecdotally driven, mm -hmm. and we have so much data. Mm -hmm. For example, I, I was just looking at some of these uh, reports that we shared, and. Um, you don't see many tickets being issued to people who have parked over overtime parking on East Main Street. It's just not, they're not there. No overtime parking isn't really a factor, especially in the winter. So maybe they're not ticketing in the winter. I, it's again, it's something that we we need more information and more data from different departments. That that was that was my initial reaction to James. It's like, thank you for all this, thoughtful, but where's we need, we need data, mm -hmm. and um, and I think there is a lot of data. Elizabeth reviewed the recommendations quickly today, and she provided a, a lot of relevant data that I'll share in, in time when it's time, but, and um, Stephen provided some data very quickly about the revenue mm -hmm. um, loss that we would experience if we did not raise the so rates. I think, let me take some responsibility for some that. of this, because when we went into parking, said to the committee we want to know what works best for the committee we want your recommendations from what works best in terms of parking for the district forget revenue I told them don't what works best and they said turnover turnover and ease turnover and ease all right give me a formula then for turnover and ease and this is what they gave us and then they went a little bit further okay but they were not to be concerned about revenue, even though it came up and I squashed them. I said, don't worry about revenue. What we want to do is make an efficient parking program for the downtown. What is, you guys, you guys have businesses down here. Tell me what it is. And they boiled it down to turnover and some ease of parking. That's basically what it was. And their recommendations of the turnover, as you saw, and their recommendations for making it easier for, for somebody to come down was to have one timing for all of when it came to revenue, I'm going to be a little bit careful on this section. They're recommending here on the revenue one a dedicated account to be used for capital parking improvements. The way the parking program envisions it is that revenue comes in from the various different streams that the parking management system generates revenue, and it should go in a bucket called parking revenue. Then from there, there are capital projects that you need, there's maintenance on all the systems that we have that needs to be done, whether we want to or not. And then there are capital projects that as you build the, res the reserve, you can let on the capital projects. There's been some discussion that the revenue that comes in from the meter parking, that pie should be split up a little bit because we do have people that help us manage the parking. Parks and rec comes in, empties garbage bins, whatever. There are certain, you know, uh, DPW, maybe they plow. But, so, don't disagree that some of that revenue should be shaved off and shared to those people that help manage the parking. But there should be a way to figure out, we've received the X, some of it's been shaved off to do projects, but there is a reserve in the parking district fund to do paving, to do engineering studies for our next engineering work for the project. Because you know the way engineering, you gotta have plans, then you have to have, as, you, know, you have to go all the way through the whole process, and you can fund that in phases. So it, I think it was always envisioned that money that came in from parking would be used to help the parking. That's all I'll say. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the way it's envisioned to be shown. Okay. It makes sense to 
actually create a budget. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. and, and actually budget for capital projects. Yes. And long term capital projects yes. for parking. To your point, also, that money should help pay for the truck that plows the. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that, and that I think that's a I want that, that's a deliberation yeah. that should be had. Uh, mm -hmm. You know how much of it goes and how much of it doesn't go. You pay for the salt that goes down, or the sand, or the paint for the stripes. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, to the extent that that goes into the parking lots that are managed by the Brighton District, we would have our support. You know, should we be paying for North Country Road and mm -hmm. and Belt Road? I don't know. So that I think that is a discussion. Yeah. The cars that park in the parking lots drive over all the streets in the village. So where do you draw the line? That's true. So uh, just from a, a discussion point of view. So that, that's, the, that's the last point under um, uh, Section 1. Section 2 went into enforcement. What, what, just to make this point, because I mentioned it before the meeting started, but you know, Stephen made it very clear that there is a parking bank account. Mm -hmm. There is a, an account already established where the revenue is um, deposited. Correct? Um, I think it's a matter of. Uh, it's how it I comes out of that. I think, I think there are several line items that I got when I got the first draft of our budget process. And, you know, the line items seemed interesting to me, just the way they were identified. I don't, I don't think Steve did the line items, but they just seemed. Don't confuse bank account with the with the budget account. Right. So he, he's depositing into a separate bank account. I don't know if he has separate line items. As so I think that it, it has a, the discipline of, of expenditure hasn't been that stringent that I'm aware of, right. and it could definitely benefit from that. So. Especially where capital projects, long-term capital sure, projects sure. are concerned. Okay, in two years we can we can uh, resurface the entire lot behind uh, Harbor Square Mall. Next year we can resurface again. Right. In theory. You know, like right. we're not. It's just like anyway. Does that make sense? It just makes sense. Plan for it. Right. Uh, section two is um, involving enforcement. One thing I want to say about enforcement is that everything in the parking district winds up in a triangle ending up with enforcement. None of it works if you don't have enforcement. These are just rough semantics, just to, just to give you an idea. But it all goes to enforcement. And it's just showing here the enforcement. We have our T2 system. The, the vigilance system is the uh, ALPR, license plate readers. Um, we have our pay by meter. Uh, that's the metric corporation. We've got seven lots that do meters. We have uh, three lots, the Barnum and the CVS lots. We have Logix that provides us the counted data for the number of spaces that are available. And then we have pay by cell, which is Honk Mobile and um, text text to pay or the QR code. Okay, so we've got about five vendors that help us manage the parking and it all works off of enforcement. If, if it's not being enforced, none of the programs will work. And the idea is to get that turnover, so we have to enforce people doing the turnover. Um, the letter makes several claims for, um, you know, the way things are going on with regard to enforcement. That's Chief Andy Owens' department. As far as the parking goes, what we want to say is nothing works without enforcement. And Andy believes he's enforcing to the best of his ability, and, I, and we don't want to comment on that. Can I ask? Okay. Sorry, are you about to go into the warning? Or no, I wasn't questions? really going to talk about that. I think that's something Andy, should, Andy Owen should mm -hmm. respond to. Uh, he did. Um, he did, actually. And we, we spoke with him. Yeah, that's his department. I'm just really curious about that because if you're, I don't know how how precise our technology is, but if you give, if you scan a license plate, can you note that you gave a warning to license plate number, you know, ABC one two three, and then two weeks later, ABC one two three is expired again, and there's a note that they've already gotten a warning because otherwise, 
So here's, uh, I can answer that for you, Please. between Elizabeth and, and um, Andy. So Elizabeth it said, um, she doesn't think that we have the, the capability for officers to know this on the go. If they scan a license plate, I know we set up a level, I believe it's currently a three, where it tells the officer if they have multiple open parking tickets. It doesn't provide them with the details as to what kind of tickets they are, doesn't show the previous warnings, and doesn't even show how old the tickets are. Mm -hmm. It could mean those three tickets were spread over 10 years for three different violation types. And so the, the vehicle owner's history is not relevant. There could be any number of drivers in one vehicle and should affect enforcement. The other um, data that she provided was on the um, enforcement of the uh, expired inspection stickers, right? Mm -hmm. So this has been some kind of a big thing, like we're not being very friendly village is the, is the contention if we issue tickets to people who have an expired uh, inspection sticker. And the revenue comes to the village, yes. Um, and it's not, but those tickets are not driven by revenue, they are driven by law, mm -hmm. according to Andy. And, and, um, you know, and then what uh, Elizabeth said is that um, the, the presumption is, the anecdotal presumption is that these tickets are written to people who maybe their um, inspection expired two weeks ago, so they just forgot, you know, and then, but, but what Elizabeth was looking at, and this was in the month of um, the weekend of January 12th through 14th, that was cited in the letter, um, is that 40, I think 47 expired um, inspection stickers were ticketed. Of those, one was within the last month. All others were two months and beyond. One was from April. So, so you know, the code enforcement's worried and has expressed concern that if we don't write this and something happens and there's an accident because mm -hmm. somebody breaks bail or you know they they get into some sort of you know mechanical fail failure due to their car is not current on inspection or past inspection, and we have an opportunity to call it out, that's then, can you trace back to that? Don't know, but if there are 47 expired inspections parked out there in the village of Port Jefferson, that's an indication too. Uh, that's a, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not good, it's not, it, but, and it is within our code to write those tickets, and I almost, felt that way for, I did, I was feeling that way for a while, but the more I hear, the more inspection tickets are, the inspection stickers are expired, the more I scratch my head and say, why? What, right. What's going on here? Yeah, just a day or two, four yeah. months. Right. right. Really. Well, and, and back uh, to April, almost yeah. a year. Yeah. So after it's enforced, so say my ticket was expired, you know, three weeks, but however long, and I, the next day, go and get my car inspected, and then I show up to court, and I say, judge, Thank you. I got the notice. Here's the proof that I went the next day. What it turns into a twenty-five dollar administrative court fee, and that's it. So, and if it's that difficult to, you know, if it, it's such a hassle to come into court, it's a lot easier to get your car inspected and not and not do that potentially. But I mean, that's and, and I I understand how. I'm like, why are they out there writing inspections? Because it's because against the law. Because they're breaking the law. <laughs> because they're breaking the law. Yeah. Yeah. Against the law. So, um, you know, I, anyway, that I thought we should have that discussion. The information that Elizabeth Kidney from the, the Justice Court provided was informative, and the concerns from the code enforcement team is very uh, um, cogent. I appreciate, Absolutely. yeah, appreciate both of them contributing so that we can have answers at the same time as asking the questions and mm -hmm. keep it interesting. Uh, section three, it's got it as section one, you intended to make it section three capital improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, again, they're calling for a dedicated corporate reserve account. Uh, and then um, regard to item number one. 
we didn't support this whole the replacement of the 12 physical pay stations. Okay, they're recommending to replace all those pay stations. There are new, there's new technology, which is less money than the old technology. I think when we replaced, or when we put in the uh, original 13, it was a cost of somewhere around $130,000 to put them in. The uh, replacement cost would be much less. Um, I think we're looking at it at a bigger number, so. uh, somewhere around $40,000. To replace all? To replace some of the meters, not all. Just, uh, Sorry? Just the volume. Just the volume. Right, not the maintenance of the operation. And, um, the installation is very minor uh, by comparison to what we had. They can be pole mounted, they can be wall mounted. They're a little bit more flexible in, um, in, um, in the way they can be installed. But again, I don't think we're looking to replace meters wholesale. The technology is going away from physical meters altogether. What we're more uh, more looking at is whether or not we're required to have a pay station as opposed to a pay by cell or internet type thing. Are we required to have a physical pay station? We know, at least from some people, there's a certain constituency that still wants to pay physically. Okay, so we may want to have some strategic pay stations where we can figure out the flow of pedestrians and put them in, in certain locations. We're not looking to replace all our pay stations in the village. I don't think we need to do that. So did we, I remember having this conversation, did we look at which pay stations are the most frequently utilized? Um, we, can, we can tell you that. We have the data for that, which stations are most utilized, which ones we want to upgrade. But, um, again, we're looking to, at this point, um, the next item to remove the inactive meters. Mm -hmm. We can agree with that. And then get a demonstration pay station. Well, this is my recommendation, mm -hmm. not the recommendation of the bid. Mm -hmm. One demonstration pay station where we can set it up and make sure that the new technology is working up to snuff. Let people get it, get used to using this, this new meter station and see how it goes. I think that's a, that's a small pilot, a small capital expense that I think we would like to recommend going into the new season, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And those funds would come out of the parking. But so when we talk about revenue, and Kevin doesn't want to hear me say this again because I'm a broken clock when it comes to this. Um, we have to, at least from my point of view, anything that happened with the parking district is water under the bridge. Where the money came from, where the money is spent, is water under the bridge. If I can get the trustees to create a dedicated fund, a dedicated parking district, we're starting with zero in the bank. So I can't tell you when we can do the next capital project based on what's coming in. If we get all the revenue that we collected in 2013, we have $600,000, then we have some money to do things with. But, based on the discussion before, all the money that comes in won't be all the money that can be used by the parking district. So when we have a budget and when we know the flow of monies, then we can talk about capital outlays. But right now, as far as I'm concerned, there is zero money in the capital budget line for the parking district. Mm -hmm. Starting in April, we will start taking money in, or May, or whenever you want to decide to start it. And from there, I don't want to be pointing fingers at past administrations. Where did the money go? How did we do it? I don't think we need to go into that exercise. I think we're starting from scratch. And we're going to do it right. We're going to create districts. We're going to create de de designated funds for those districts and move through a parking program the way it should be done. So, I mean, we do have a lot of things that need to be done, but based on all the other demands that you're going to get, unless we can piggyback onto some public works things <coughs> or other projects, I don't see how our standalone projects are going to rise to the top when we only have so much to do. So much to use. That's just me being very practical, and I'm sure that there are people disappointed when I say that. But I'm just trying to be practical, I'm trying to understand where the trustees and what Kevin Gafka is telling me. Or Stephen. Uh, Stephen, I'm sorry. Stephen is telling me. Um, I haven't had that first name back yet. It's only been three plus months. But um, Stephen's, you know, he's telling me that, that we have issues, so I'm trying to respect that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so are we able to reuse meters? If, let's say there's a meter that isn't being used in a certain area that frequently. From what I understand, the meters have about another five years of life to them. Uh -huh. You know, don't know which one is going to go down what, which part's going to go down which. The you know the newer meters have less pieces, less parts, less less, less right. things to break. But we could salvage some of the meters, I would think. Uh, not all of them are not being used. The ones that aren't being used are used as kiosks. Let me just make that point. While the bid didn't like them, the kiosks are meters that are not functioning at the moment, but they do provide information pamphlets that go out, the signage on them. There's a question of whether or not you want to remove them altogether or leave them. But to answer your question, we can salvage and start to cannibalize parts to keep meters working. Okay. And are the new, new meters, um, do they take cash or are they card only? Um, I That's think they're card only. I don't think they coin. They take I coin, but they don't take paper cash. Which maybe simplifies. One of the problems with meters, there's two things with, meet, with, ca with cash meters is paper money tends to jam up. Not as often as people say. The data doesn't show it jams up as often as people say, but paper money jams up. The coins are just heavy when you got to move that stuff. Now you're dealing with weight mm -hmm. with coin meters. But if you know the uh, vending machine industry, they're going more coins, dollar coins. Plus, um, giving change, I think, was difficult in the uh, newer machines. Mm -hmm. You have to have these action. Uh, so removal of ina inactive meters, they're recommending we, we can do that. And like I just said, we can remove inactive meters. We can use them as kiosks, uh, so they do perform the function. But if, if the trustees agree they should come out, we don't really have a problem. How many broken meters do we have or inactive meters do we have? I don't know. At the moment, it's okay. Thank you. So why are they saying they're, why are they suggesting to remove inactive meters if there are no Because meters, you know, you do, meters are machines and they do break down sometimes. So anecdotally, you may think that that meter that broke down yesterday is still broken, you know, and now we're, we're talking about a meter over here that has got a paper jam or something, so now, now this meter's broken. But at the moment, all the meters, at the end of last season and, and to open now, all the meters are Oh, is there is there data to? Because I would imagine uh, looking at the parking, uh, if, if every meter has an amount that's coming in, if that's tracked, uh, we'd know if it was, how long it was broken or if it was broken by no money coming. Yeah, data on individual meters. Right. So that would be that would tell us something. And it says here that they are covered with a sign when they're broken. So there's none covered with a sign saying that. Well, they're right now everything's covered. Right. But I mean. So at the end of last season, all the meters were working. Then they should have been corrected, I guess, on that one. Well, we went back and forth. Kevin was, we went back and forth with Kevin. And we thought we had an understanding on the content of the letter and, and the letter expanded. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, the, the, the implementation of Exeter Park, again, that's um, one of the capital recommendations. Um, this is a... Um, a space monitoring system that um, uses a small tool like a hockey puck. You put it into the asphalt. It uh, records when a car is there. It sends it to a, a station, and that station reports all sorts of data. So um, that would be great all up and down Main Street. That's the ask of the committee. We're recommending that we do one or a handful just to do as a pilot program. So we had a meter as a pilot program, and we're recommending that we do a pilot program for these things. This will give us the real turnover data on Main Street and Arden and East Main Street if we were to do them for all those streets. Can we do it on Main Street? We, that's, I was going to say that. We, state we probably can, but we need state permission. Yeah. We can do it on East Main. So the, the, the equipment um, that we purchased to monitor and, and enforce parking on East Main Street, does that make that up? So they'll be looking to make that. I believe it just works. bought it last year, right? The, Which the, the APLR. Uh -huh. I think it reports to the APLR. I think they're, they're an integrated system. You make them an integrated system where they So the APLR isn't working? 
Do we know what it goes, is? I think it is work. Goes to work, to make that work, or why is it just more efficient? Now what happens, happens is, um, again, my, my own experience at the state, pull into the spot, my daughter said, you don't need to do the meter, we never get a ticket. Sure enough, I pulled into that spot, it had that technology, boom, parking person there, boom, ticket. Yeah. Well, that makes that begs the question: If we're trying to be a more friendly village, without but slamming everyone right away, the data they know when the, it notifies their system when the spot is occupied, mm -hmm. and when the meter is not. So I didn't use the app, so it knew, knew that a car was in the spot and had not paid for yeah. the spot. It sounds it sounds like we should have bought it last year before we yeah. bought the license plate meter. So. I don't know enough about the technology. Technology is always changing, right? Technology is generally made so we can at least talk to the old technology in the beginning. Um, but um, there were suggestions to meter Main Street and East Main Street. Yeah. So these are alternative ways to monitor mm -hmm. timing. And I don't know at this point which is more efficient or a better tool, the APLR or the uh, so that's what it sounds like the 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 new technology is fun and fancy and you know could be very helpful for us. But what I want to do is I would rather see if our current technology works mm -hmm. if we're using it right and if we're implementing the technology and if we aren't why aren't we? So data again is the driving force here. I'll get you an answer. Okay. Right, and and again, it's like to to trust you beyond his experience. Uh, that's not very effective of, of the local government, but I'm sure it wasn't happy. Like, did, did you yeah. end up getting a ticket? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and you okay. gave it to Caroline, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's similar. Right. It's similar where my where my father-in-law lives. Um, there's resident parking, and the APLRs. The, the license plate readers come down and they immediately know if you're a non-resident, you only have two hours, and then the, when they sweep through again, it's interesting to watch because the car is going down the block at a pretty good clip. You just need to stop, back up, they get out, summons. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'd like to ride around with the mm -hmm. PJ3 and see how that works, really to get a sure. visual of that. Well, and the, and the um, APLR still would be necessary in the lots, all of our other lots that yeah. don't have these yeah. pucks, because we we're not putting pucks at every one of our. There, how much are they a piece? They're mm. uh, four thousand thirty something. Sorry, mm -hmm. a piece? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's an expensive puck. Almost. Yeah. And then um, it breaks. Easy. Yeah. And then it says, it re, you know, so no, it's, it's like. Let's see, he says, well, it's included 10 years. Technology is one time cost. So they recommend the 37, 37 spaces, 37, and that was at 9,700. And then a uh, reoccurring $3,600 cost for the maintenance. Isn't that more so? Yeah. 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 I'm going to say yes, probably. The it's probably the sensor on yeah. yeah. In one yeah, exactly okay. it's it is. Yeah. The fourth, they're small. Mm -hmm. Is this what we have in um, the Barnum and CDS box? No. No? Okay. Here you go. Okay. Yeah, we, do, like, we have these things we can leave with you. Um, this is the brochures and the technology. It's, it's in the email. Okay. Very good. Again, I wanted to get through this and any detail or analysis and stuff like that we can definitely get to. Okay. Right. Okay, so then the letter pretty much wraps up there. Uh, he makes a comment on um, some of the revenue that it spent over the past and coordinating with the bid. I can't comment on that. So concluding then, last year, the Parking Management Program brought in $640,000. There are changes recommended by the Parking Committee in terms of the program, in terms of the season, in terms of the timing, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, is the program season timing, uh, signage, messaging, um, a dedicated parking account, 
in terms of capital, they're recommending meter investments and these monitors. Um, it's our assessment that the, if we implement the parking recommendation, the recommendations from the bid um, on the parking management system, that there will be an impact on the revenue downward. Mm -hmm. Definitely be a downward revenue generation if we trim the shoulder seasons, if we cut down the hours. So that was obvious, you know. But again, I didn't tell them to worry about that. Okay. Um, the downward curve on the revenue is about one hundred sixty thousand dollars. So that's what we would lose by implementing the big program. Again, all these numbers can be um, firmed up, but that's our first cut. Roughly $160,000 would be lost if we, if we implemented the uh, big recommendations as is. I'm noting the comment of the Treasurer's Office, basically saying that he could not support any major capital investments this year, in so many words. Um, so I'm just noting that. So these are the recommendations of the parking department as from my office. Um, I would recommend increasing the fees to offset revenue loss from some of the recommended timing and seasonal changes or broaden the season to um, busy year-round weekends, keeping Monday through Thursday free for April, October, and November. So we have an alternative um, revenue plan for the show And we thought that the, the bid um, would be interested in entertaining that. But at least there are two ways to generate the revenue back. Raise fees or change the program. Um, <clears throat> instead of eliminating the shoulder seasons, charging on the weekends for the shoulder seasons. Because as you observe, we had a very busy weekend and we're not even in the parking season. Right. Well, I feel like that, maybe that, that's a little counter to their ease of use. It's not like, oh, what, what month is it? Is it, you know, it, what day of the week? It is parking. Well, again, I don't know which segment of the population, I don't know if it's fair to say it, but a certain segment of the population may, that are registering a lot of the complaints that we don't find substantiated by data may be coming Monday to Friday. Using restaurants, Monday to Friday, and on the weekends, maybe they're not coming into town. Maybe it was more for, you know, um, different types of uh, clientele. Don't know. With, maybe the bid won't like that. Maybe, maybe the trustees will think it's more confusing. What we're trying to do right now is come up with recommendations to offset the decrease in the revenue if you were to find that the bid's recommendations were doable. You wanted to do that. If you do them, you don't lose revenue. We can make up some of that revenue and keep it flat. Um, we get it. Um, the second recommendation is to adjust some of the uh, program recommendations to offset the revenue loss from the, from the seasonal changes. Uh, calibrate the street timing to bid recommendations. We could do that. We think we can do that. Implement the amended program recommendations. Uh, some of those we can do. Um, we certainly recommend instituting a dedicated parking account for parking districts. And we can all see the various districts. Um, this one combined. Um, we don't have a disagreement with removing the non-working meters and kiosks. Um, we believe that the Board of Trustees and the Treasurer need to recognize the ongoing maintenance expenses, and regardless of what sort of system we have in place for managed parking, we will need to have capital drawdown to pay for the maintenance and the operation because we pay for software support as well. So that's got to be in the budget for the next coming season. Um, we're not going to recommend any large-scale capital investments, and um, if we do recommend anything, it will be pilot-scale investments. That's proven. So that's pretty much the overview of this letter and trying to put it into context of what's going on in the village in terms of parking. Um, people will go to other parking districts throughout Suffolk County, throughout Long Island, and I can say that Port Jefferson is unique among parking districts. We have a funnel that trend that sends everybody downtown, but we have two commercial business districts. It's the downtown district that takes the brunt of everything. And every time we have it happening, and every time 4,500 residents with free parking passes wants to come down to one of our happenings, it creates a problem right from the word go. Obviously, 4,500 people aren't coming down, but enough of them come down to cause a problem. For example, this weekend, we observed that the exterior barn lot in the CES lot was not occupied. So where were all the employees for all the restaurants and bars yeah. parking? 
they were parking downtown, probably very close to where they work. You got to get them out of there. And there's no program that we can do other than getting the data to understand that. So that's part of the problem. Do you know how many employees? There's roughly 200 employees, I guess, within businesses. So that, that takes a big chunk out of our available parking downtown. Again, I'm, I'm super, I'm incredibly interested in data. Um, any data that we can get our hands on that tells us who these, the people who are parking in the parking lots are, who's paying during, this, during the, the season when we are charging, who's paying for, our, for parking. The parking department is very much data driven. You can have any kind of data you want, the parking department can give you the data. When I went into this, I was going in on the theory Tell me what it is the bid needs. I'm sorry. Tell me what it is the the, uh, the commercial business district needs to make you a successful commercial business district. They said turnover. The way you get turnover is to enforce your parking regulations. We want it to be simple for people, so we're going to homogenize the signage and the hours and things like that. Uh, therefore, That's what they said. therefore, that being the logic that we're following, how do we know? what that turnover looks like if we don't have the data that's telling us. That's right. How long is someone sitting in that parking lot? I read two books on parking since becoming a trustee. And the universal theme is the sweet spot, charging the amount which will force the turnover. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's let's have a conversation that we've been having before. Brookhaven charges five dollars an hour. They put pressure on us Right. So people go in there, five dollars, no way, I'm going to pay a buck an hour across the street. That's right. We can raise our rates almost to five dollars. Mm -hmm. We can be competitive. Would we be the same as Pancho? No, Pancho's at a buck fifty. But they don't have a Brookhaven lot right next door forcing people into our lot. Also, I learned something. When I first came here, I talked it about... It prevents, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it also prevents employees from parking in there. It's five dollars. Five dollars is per minute. Un unless they're Brookhaven residents, right, in which case maybe an education Permit. campaign to the businesses and employees is saying, hey, uh, you can get a Brookhaven permit if you're a Brookhaven resident for, what is it, uh, the 30, dollars 30 dollars? So that's um, another thing. Brookhaven charges residents for their parking permits. Yes. Right. This village does not. Right. So there are all sorts of revenue opportunities the Board of Trustees has to deliberate on whether or not they want to pass that on to the... Thinking outside the stage for torture. Well, yep. these are... These are <laughs> well, I think town town is... Plus it's, it's kind of like your village residence, that's your, one of your prime purposes. Yeah, it is. It's a per and I, I agree, we agree we entirely with that data because, okay, um, visitors to Danford's gets a free parking pass. Visitors to the country club get parking passes. And it all adds up to 4,500 passes a year. Is there logic in all of that? I'd be interested in seeing the data of how many residents are parking. Mm -hmm. That's right. Could the, the LPR give us that? Should. Yeah. Find that out because if you're not if you're not registering your license plate when you pull into a space, I don't know if it's counting you. If you if you're a resident, so here's the question. Actually, it does pick it up. If you're a resident, it has to the rest and there, right. you're, and you're parked on Main Street. If you're a resident, are you limited to the two hours too? Oh yeah. 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 So they're reading all those license plates, and they know when you're a resident. But I think I remember hearing that you don't. They don't store data unless you write a ticket. So like it's only hum. I would wonder if or the technology keeps the data. Well, that's what I would wonder. Not the LPR or the code right. officer, but but our residents do. So another thing is that um, in parking stall demand reduction, one of the tools to get people to not have a car when they live in a transit-oriented district is to unbundle, unquote, unbundle the cost of parking. I've said this before. If your rent is fifteen hundred dollars, I said no, no, your rent is a thousand. I'm charging you two fifty of parking space in that garage below. Um, I might say. Let me say two fifty a month to get rid of one of my cars because I can hop on the train or the bus or the cab or the Uber or whatever. Or if I'm a resident, I could park in which other seems that would talk. That's right. 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 So, but what is happening is, um, I think it's Overbay. Overbay said, "Hey, let's try this unbundling." So they did, and what happens is now the people who would be paying to park in Overbay are now going outside and parking for free in the village. Yeah. 
So we've got competing programs. So I thought we talked a little bit about this too. I think it was with you who spoke about this. Is does it make sense we have, you know, sometimes two people, three people living in an apartment, two people drive, two cars. Do you have a zone where you limit the and it's a the zone is the downtown zone, you know, commercial district zone. You issue one parking pass per resident. In the, in the rental sort of zone. That would help the pressure for oh, our limited resident parking spaces. For residents. Resident. So you're encouraging walkability, pedestrian travel in the downtown district. So you're not taking up to, you know, a spot when you... Sorry, I'm not, I'm not following. If, if, if each person, if there's three people living in a two-bedroom apartment and each person is issued a parking pass, mm -hmm. then each one of them can have a car. Mm -hmm. Each one of them can have a car, but they only get one parking pass per apartment. That's the oh, okay. residence. Uh, yes. Residence. Okay. Yes. 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 So yes. one pass per residence. residence. Yeah. Per residence. Per residence. Okay. I was gotcha. Sorry, sorry. Oh, S, plural. S or right. C. Yeah. E, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Got it. Um, that's interesting. That's, that's a policy. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, well, I think, so the, back to the bundling, I thought that we, we Prohibited unbundling. I thought. I thought we. I think after the. I think it was the shipyard that was the impetus for that. But then I thought we were saying. Well, maybe it was shipyard. It was one of the two. The the what, um, what, the former mayor told me, if I'm remembering it correctly, is when she found out that the shipyard was charging seventy five dollars per spot, mm -hmm. to each as an extra cost to each um, uh, apartment. Dweller, she's like, well, I didn't know they were doing that. That can never happen again. Like, we can't charge a separate rationale for that because that is a tool that's right. used to manage parking. So, I don't know what her rationale did. You think that that was gouging? I don't know. No, I, I, if you pay, if, if you're because it, they were parking in our lots, that's my understanding. Well, if it was the reverse that trend, then yeah. that's fine, right? And, and that, yeah, that was it. And then I know when the Barnum lot went in, the concern was. Oh, right, this is just a free parking lot for shipyard and Overbay residents, which right. right now the lot behind Overbay is. It's technically village, a village lot uh, that's right. just, yeah, it's just overflow for, for Overbay. Um, but, but I know that was, that was addressed by saying, I think the uh, Barnum lot, there's no parking after what time? 12 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning? Um, and so that means it's not an overnight lot. But then there's no enforcement. There's no. Right. So how's that? Right, and then they don't come in. And then they don't come in until 10 o'clock, so there's no enforcement. You know, okay, off to work I go at 8, 8.30. I don't know. You know, it's. It sounds like enforcement is one of the key pillars to, to solving turnover and uh, people not staying in lots overnight when, you know. I mean, what they could do if you really don't want parking in Barnum Lot after midnight is it could be one of the one of the gates that get closed mm -hmm. off by code sure. at the end of the night. Does it not already? No. no. I just assumed there's no gate. No. It took half the have been used because they've been adhering to the rules. It, it's the lot empties out. But still, they would, they would have to close the gates at 1 a.m. if they're not here. That's why it's right. So we could take turns. We don't have time. To us, right? But then you have to have someone. I think I don't know technically, but usually, like when they close the gates over at Centennial, there's a number to call. Right. So you're, right. you know you can get home. You um, get stuck in there. You can get stuck yeah, in there. Yeah, get stuck in there. Never happens. Running down the beach. Um, so I can um, provide you our recommendations. I can provide you our memo, which yes, yes analyze that in a little bit more detail, uh, and uh, we will get you some data, mm -hmm. some of the data that you looking for. And, uh, again, we have data and we have um, observation anecdotal observation. Mm -hmm. And while the observation in this little area may be accurate, overall, 
it doesn't represent the parking system. Data really opens up your understanding of sure. what's working, what's not working, and when, you know, how to how to even approach the the corrections. Well, and I think it's important. Obviously, the squeakiest wheels, you know, the, the folks who are having, the, you know, sort of the most the, the loudest reactions to things that are frustrating. Um, it's it is important to understand if there's a pattern there uh, that we can sort of improve on the edges. But I, I agree entirely that the data has to be the driver of decision making in, uh, in this process. And uh, yeah, data can ignore certain things you think on the fringe, but uh, so that's still valuable information from our business owners. We don't want to, we're not ignoring them, but um, clearly not. No. Right. No. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. I think Andy, thank you, Kevin, too. And are we talking about the pilot? Um, I don't have anything prepared, but I'd be happy to answer questions with regards to the playoff. I didn't know we had a deadline for responding to that. Because I don't think you do have a deadline to respond to that. The playoff is a legislative act by the Board of Trustees. You don't have a timetable on that. But is it Just holding up the planning board? No, it's not holding No, the applicant is condemning it, it's holding up the planning board, but the planning board is, is waiting on certain issues from the applicant. So there are still details with regard to the condition of use in the site plan. So the planning board's not ready to approve it. I mean, no, we're talking between about now and the next time the planning board meets, could they get into the planning board and have it satisfied? They could, but they don't right now. Mm -hmm. So for them to say that this is the only thing holding up the application, that's not true. And I think, I think with the pilot discussion, I, the planning board has been consistent over the years on the recommendation, and the Board of Trustees has been consistent in um, adjusting that fee. What we don't have is the deliberations of the Board of Trustees on reasonable to lower the fee. You know, there are any number of reasonable reasons to lower that fee, project specific. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the benefit of the planning board. We don't have the benefit of the information that the planning board has been privy to over the last two years since this applicant has been trying to secure this space. Um, if you don't have the staff reports, which I think you do have, um, we can resend them to you. But the staff reports outline the history of the case. It outlines what the, what the board is looking for at this time. Uh, so the staff reports have been rather clear on the deficiencies of the application from meeting to meeting to meeting. But with reasons why they're asking for a uh, reduction in the, you know, a, a consideration in, with the pilot? I don't know their rationale, but I can tell you why we're not recommending a decrease in the pilot, is that their proposed usage is not just dropping off the dog for grooming and being picked up. They, would, they indicate in their application boarding indicating their application um, activities, you know, similar to assembly, uh, maybe a birthday party for a dog or something like that. Um, there will obviously be, if they do retail, there will be retailing in there so people will park to buy things for their pet before or after they pick up the pet. So there's a lot of activities there that lead us to make the multiplier based on the size of the building. We have the option to base it on the number of employees but the code reads size of building or number of employees, whichever is greater. So the size of the building generates the number of parking spaces that's greater. Um, what does the number of employees mean? I don't remember off the top of my head. It, you know, if it's 10, which I think that'd be a lot for that operation, that's only 10 spaces and then the park has 17. Mm -hmm. so. And do we have history of that location? Any you mean uses? prior to? Uh -huh. Uh, we took a quick look today when I found out it was going to be on the agenda. We do not know how it got to operate the way it was. The building might have been pre-existing. The use might have been pre-existing. I don't know. The light shop? I don't know. Right? AC Electric, and prior to that, there was a auto At the auto parts. Yeah. The type of use might be different. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just wondering how many spots yeah. they were required to have. But once a use changes, you generally don't grandfather the parking. No. The parking usually goes to use. I think that's you can make an argument if it's retail to retail, but this is not strictly auto parts retail or electrical retail. 
this is a grooming operation with retail, with assembly, with other things. So it's just a different animal. It's just a different land use than the prior land uses. So we take a new, a new look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, my, so my understanding of the pilot program at large, specific to this business and, and in general, is that essentially it's saying, hey, we don't have these spaces, but we're giving the village money um, essentially to, to create or maintain other spaces. So up, up there we have, uh, in the vicinity of that building, we have the Perry Street lot, right? That's the closest municipal lot. Across the way behind, you know, near the hills, we have some parking there. Um, I know uh, a group of us have been looking at shared parking opportunities uh, uptown because there's seas of parking uh, at, you know, and it's all empty essentially outside of the 9 to 5, uh, Monday through Friday. So, you know, that, that those monies coming in would you know, theoretically help the village either um, uh, leverage and, and maintain lots that are shared, you know, if we enter into agreements with shared parking, maintain our own lots up there. It's just a question of, uh, I don't know, in my mind, it's a question of capacity and of those lots, which largely are avoidable. And they're robust. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. Well, and, and I, can speak for myself. The, I'm, I hope to see businesses coming into the uptown, um, and, and these service businesses are a you know, great complement to the apartments that are in there, and you know all this. So um, almost to the point of you know being parking business friendly. You know, how are we not uh, putting the village at a disadvantage, but seeing that we're keeping the door open for businesses that want to come in um, you know, without charging them an exorbitant It's no secret what the parking requirements are in the village. Um, notwithstanding the parking, there are other problematic uh, items with regard to this application on this particular property. Um, it's a bad use on this particular piece of property. If it was a different use, we might be having a different conversation with this particular use with the operational requirements that they have um, doesn't doesn't give the staff doesn't give the department any reason to um, re recommend dropping the parking lot. Do we know? This is just thinking outside of the box because uptown is almost akin to New York City, you know, or, or like a, a real urban area that you have the storefront. And you know, there they're even lucky they have what five spots in the very front, and then just some street parking, and that's you know. And then we have these lots around the corner, this and that. Um, what do more urban municipalities do to to address this? Do they, you know, every time a uh, they build surface parking or structures, that's how they address it. No, they, as far as like pylop or other. They would take money from the parking and go into the parking district, and then when there's funds available. They generally the idea of the pilot. The um, issues with that project, or the two that pop out into my mind that are problematic is that it's a drive-through operation where the drive-through itself is problematic. There's infrastructure that, that helps with the building that's in the drive-through area that has to be removed and placed somewhere else. That, that type of infrastructure. So the landlord needs to get involved, or the applicant is going to have to pay to move those things around. That seems to be a sticking point. Not only that, but the access way itself is poorly paved. It needs to be repaved, especially if those things are going to come out. And there's some drainage stuff that's going on with that too. So there are issues. So. Just the whole access way and the whole mode, modus operandi, if you will, um, is, is a fatal flaw from the word go until they fix that. And that has been an issue from the word go, and it's still an issue. The landowner came and yelled at the planning board that it was an issue, and it's still an issue. So 
that's issue number one that had not been resolved with the applicant, notwithstanding what the applicant says that it's the trustee and the pilot lot that's holding it up. It's not. It's the fact that we have not gotten to a resolution on that actual access way for the drop wall. Is that hinging at all on the trustee's determination, this court's determination of pilot fee uh, regarding the applicant understanding, okay, here's my pilot fee. I might be willing to put X amount towards paving or X, you know, that, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to understand it. It's saying it's the car for Which is right. it? Right. Yeah. 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 Which is it? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Or or do we not need to make a determination? I sat in on a few of those meetings and to Andy's point, I don't know what happened before, but my looking at this, that building is, it's probably not a good, as he explained, not a good use because they're going to be investing a lot of money to fix the things that they need to fix in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. And then but we're not delivering that. Yeah. Right. 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 So are we thinking of deliberating what we've been asked to deliberate? Is that usually the, how the process works? It is in the middle of the uh, application process and review, the Board of Trustees weighs in on the pilot yep. at the same time, simultaneous? It, it's, it can happen at either time because we're not reviewing the application based on the pilot. If mm -hmm. you deny, if you say, no, we don't want your money into the pilot program, then the, then the, the plan board is going to say, okay, go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Some way they need to get their relief from the parking. It doesn't have to come from the Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. But the issues related to the site plan won't change whether or not they get a pilot. The ZBA first. Uh, there are tests for the ZBA, and there are no tests for the, for the trustees. So it's a different process. Well, but if they go to the ZBA, then we forego the pilot fees. So if, if they get the variance. If they're right. the variance. So if they're granted the variance by the ZBA, then. Yeah, if we wanted to collect pilot fees, then we lose that opportunity. If they get the on this, app they get on this application. Right. But, you know, and, and these are calculus, calculuses that the uh, project sponsor and the landowner have to make. There's a lot of speculation going on in town, um, including properties around this property and this property, and everybody is going to make a, uh, you know, a long term. Assessment. Okay. That answers everything with all the questions I have. Okay. And, and the data that I didn't have, you will have. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to talk to your I have a question. Right. Any other issues you want to talk about today? We have a motion to close. Motion, motion to close. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.